The story is told of two brothers who grew up on a farm. One went away to college, earned a law degree, and became a partner in a prominent law firm in the state capital. The other brother stayed on the family farm. One day, a lawyer came and visited his brother, the farmer. He asked, why don't you go out and make a name for yourself and hold your head up high in the world, like me. Brother pointed, said, see that field of wheat over there? Look closely. Only the empty heads stand up. Those that are well filled always bow low. Said differently, the branch that bears the most fruit is bent the lowest to the ground. D.L. Moody once said, the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace. Convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life. But as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, today is Sunday morning. So, when I say to you, Sunday's coming, you should have no problem saying amen. Is that right? All righty then. <laughs> Our Linton text for today says, For even the Son of Man came not to serve, or not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, in our postmodern society, we confuse greatness with power, and power is the exercise of control over others. Money is often seen as power. People, therefore, desire money for what they think it gives them power. A strange thing, when you read the Gospels, there's only a few times that you see Jesus dealing with money. Now, I'm not talking about saying something that you can apply to money. I'm talking about actually dealing with money. In Luke chapter 12 beginning at verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. TMZ might have a problem with that thought, but they'll catch the revelation eventually. Then in Matthew 17, beginning of verse 24, when they came to Capernaum, collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? Peter said, yes. Now, as an aside here, drachma was a day's wage, so two drachma tax was two days wages. Now, some of you all might know how it feels when you go to work and you're still counting the days till your paycheck isn't being diverted to the government. That's how it was for them too. Well, at any rate, when Peter got into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? Now, he should have known he was in trouble when he heard his name Simon called. From whom do the kings of the earth 
take toll or tax from their sons or from others? Well, when he said from others, Jesus said to him, well, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shackle. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So Jesus took care of that for him. But at the same time, notice it wasn't because he was concerned about the situation. There was always other people that brought money issues to Jesus, not the other way around. Now, the events in our gospel text today take place in the context of questions about power and authority. Jesus had told the 12 for the third time, I might add, that he's about to go to Jerusalem where, by all appearances, his absolute lack of power will be on display to all. You all heard the reading earlier, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but just to remind you, Taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what would happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and will spit on him, and will flog him, and will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Amen to the word of the Lord. Now, every single verb in this passage puts Jesus on the receiving end of the action of others, except the last one. And even then, he's the object of the action because he is raising himself. Now, we normally think of those who are subject to others as being weak, don't we? The strong, we think of as those who are able to control other people. Now, previously in this whole series of events, some Pharisees came to him with a question about divorce, not because they respected his wisdom, mind you, but to test him. He deals with that. And people bring their children to him so that he could touch them. But they don't first ask whether it's okay. And they just, well, figure Jesus in the house and he'll, he don't mind blessing my child. And in fact, it's true, Jesus loves blessing children. But that's not the point. No, it in no way removes the fact that no one thought it necessary to ask, Lord, would you mind? Lord, I know it's been a long day, but you know, could you please? No, no, they just brought them on. In fact, you think about it, maybe the disciples were acting out of concern for his well-being when they tried to stop him. By verse 17, Jesus is back on the road. And a man runs up to him asking for advice on what he must do to inherit eternal life. Now, think about this. There, there, I don't know of any question more important than that question other than, will you marry me? Fellas, you know what I'm talking about. So Jesus could have given this man all kinds of philosophically deep, astute answers that he would have the rest of his life to ponder on. But he didn't. He gives them something direct, concrete, easy to understand. You think that the man would say in response to that, thank you, Lord. In fact, I'll get on that right away. Uh, no. Instead, he walks away distressed and grieving. I know your Bibles probably say he went away sorrowful, but when, when you see that, you think of somebody with their head bowed, you know, oh dear. But the word luominos actually means grieving and distressed frustrated, not just passively feeling bad, but actively unhappy about it. And it says, because he owned a lot of stuff. He's probably thinking in his head, who does this rabbi Jesus think he is? Telling me to give up my hard earned stuff. 
And then his disciples reacted to it all with amazement. It's almost like they're saying, what is Jesus talking about? Those folks that have wealth, it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of God. Well, they can enter into Herod's house. They can go talk to Caesar. They can do anything they want to do. You mean God don't respect folk with money? Hmm. In most churches and organizations, pastors are strong figures. They are large and in charge, decision makers, movers and shakers. But here in the LCMS, where we don't have any bishops, and presidents may only advise rather than command, we pastors might be beloved, but we are not as a rule feared. Missionaries are about the same level, maybe even a little bit lower because not all missionaries are ordained and having the responsibility of exercising the office of the key. Now, concerning the work of an apostle, and, and as an aside, you know, I've got a few friends who think the apostle's office is so important that they want to be called apostles. I don't know why they want to be called apostles. I haven't seen any books in the Bible with a name on it. I haven't seen them suffering anything, but they want to be called apostles. And, you know, I don't want to get into an argument with them. So I just go along with it. But here's what real apostle Paul said about that office. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 9, he said, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Sometimes I feel like we should be on that list too, brother. Yes, indeedy. In fact, the way people talk about pastors nowadays and preachers in general, you think we stole something from everybody and then showed off about it when we got out the door. To hear some folk tell it, oh, I guess, Pastors and preachers are maybe one step above or maybe below the tax man. Don't nobody seem to like us until they want us. But that's all right. That's actually only one reason I can think of that anybody would accept this vocation. 2 Corinthians 5.14 tells us, For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. Him who for their sake died and was raised. Amen. As I'm talking about Jesus now, folks, if you didn't know, this is his day. When I look at the city of Gary, where I am currently deployed as a missionary, I see a city which over half of its residents don't think God's people can do anything to affect this downward spiral. It won't end until the last widow dies and the last homeless person hitches a ride to heaven. Of course, by then, the politicians will have drained all of whatever money remains, but hey, it's that's Gary, right? It's a city in such poor shape that they had to take a missionary in order to get any sort of pastoral care. Here at St. Paul's, you get to see one of what? Three pastors every Saturday, every Sunday, every week for Bible study and confirmation class. Y'all do go to Bible study, right? Come on, nod your heads. Even if you don't, just, you know, I won't know the difference. So come on now. <laughs> Anytime you need counseling, you can just call him up and get an appointment. In Gary, well, they're lucky to see a pastor every week. They're so grateful to the Synod, and by the Synod, I don't mean Synod Incorporated. I'm not talking about that big, pretty building in St. Louis with the purple pillars and the, the mirrored glass. I'm talking about people like y'all. People in congregations this morning hearing the pure gospel preached and the sacraments distributed. People hearing that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake and so that they can go in peace. That's what I think of when I think of the Senate. 
And so I just want you to know that my, me, my wife, Lenita, my children, Delwin II, Dania, and Dinah, we are so grateful. We are grateful for your prayers. We're grateful for your encouragement. We're grateful for your financial support, for your short-term mission trips, for Project Reforge. We're grateful for all the things you do to help us help Gary turn around. We're just grateful and thankful to God and to you for your generosity. Now, what are Gary's prospects without the pure gospel? For that matter, what are Munster's prospects without the preaching of the pure gospel? Well, I don't know much about Munster. You all do, though. You all know the difference you can and are making in this city by your living out what Christ has given us to do. But in Gary, a year ago, Gary had one functioning church, two congregations on the verge of closure, and a third was using a Baptist pastor. In fact, he wasn't even a pastor. He was just a Baptist preacher, a licensed preacher. How would you feel if you had to give offerings to a Baptist preacher in order to have something vaguely approaching God's word coming to you? Kind of makes you get old shivers just thinking about it, don't it? <laughs> but I tell you something, a year later, we have two churches, a school, two transitional residences that have made major differences in the lives of some desperate, destitute people. Now just imagine what Gary could be like if I didn't have to spend as many days as possible on the road encouraging support. What would Gary be like if the light of the pure gospel were going forth regularly? If the poor were hearing the pure gospel without fail? What would Gary be like if the political leaders knew that there was going to be a preacher that would not fail to proclaim God's active presence in both the left hand and the right hand kingdom? God has blessed this church in so many ways. I look around, I see the evidence in this beautiful sanctuary. I feel the evidence in the kindness of your fellowship that you've shown me these past two days, in the vigor with which your pastors support Mission Field USA, Project Gary, and in the prayers of God's people as they pray for us regularly. Now, I pray that you would join Pastor Speckhart both corporately and as the Lord leads you as individuals in continuing that great treasured support. Amen. You know, everything that Jesus said that the chief priests and scribes would do, they did. Everything that Jesus said that the Gentiles would do, they did. On Friday, they mocked Jesus like nobody's business. But then... Sunday came. Friday, they beat him like he stole something. But then Sunday came. Friday, they put a heavy wooden cross on his bruised and bloody back. But then, say it with me, Sunday came. Friday, they hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head and for you, he died. But then... Sunday came. You are here today because Sunday came. You are forgiven and justified because Sunday came. You are have a called servant of the word because Sunday came. Sunday came and Jesus rose. Sunday came, the devil was defeated. Sunday came and sins are forgiven. Bread is broken and a cup is shared. Sunday came and God's promises are declared. Sunday, as a songwriter wrote, it will be Sunday every day. We can walk around heaven all day. For now, Sunday comes every week here. And with the Senate's help, Sunday will come to Gary 
every week. Jesus rose on a Sunday morning, and together we're taking that message to the ends of the earth and right around the corner. So join me. Join me today at the service where we can share with you what God is doing in Gary. Join me this afternoon at 2 o'clock where with President May and missionaries, both national and international, will share what God is doing and your part in it as you all become missionaries. And then above all, join me. Join me in celebrating Jesus in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings here and in Gary with people you know and with people you've never met. One body, one cup, and one confession. And let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let all God's people say, Amen.